Hello and welcome to the seventh training video in the Waffles training series. This is the final pre-survey video. We'll have one more video come out that is focused on data entry uh, after you've completed your surveys. In this video we're going to talk about the other birds of interest. There are five species that we're collecting counts on at each of the survey points and we want to talk about why we record these other birds of interest. Uh, we want to review those species and then I want to talk a little bit about uh, eBird data entry if for those of you who use eBird and may want to submit your data. So why do we record other birds of interest? Uh, main reason is that we will be out in um, unusual habitat so habitat that birders don't often go to as a destination. We may pass through there very quickly, but we're stopping spending some time focusing on the landscape. So we have the opportunity to see birds uh, at a, uh, that don't always get reported and at a time of year where uh, there are less people out in the environment and, and less people observing uh, the behavior and the bird uh, populations and at a time of day right before dark uh, where we also uh, spend less time uh, out on the landscape looking for birds. So the combination of these three factors um, a lot give us an opportunity to see birds uh, that may not otherwise be recorded and provide valuable information about landscape use of those birds. Uh, in comparison to eBird, uh, we eBird is a tremendous resource for uh, all sorts of conservation and research, yet we will have a resolution that they don't have. Uh, so it's a good general platform, uh, but we don't know all the specifics. There's traveling counts, getting locations down, etc. can be difficult. Uh, here we will have a fixed location at each of our survey points. We know where we were when you saw the uh, uh, the particular bird of interest, etc. So uh, we can provide a, a better level of data to the management agencies with regards to those bird distributions. And uh, then the question of why these five specific birds uh, that we will focus on, four of them are species of greatest conservation need in at least one of our states, uh, some of them in, in most all of our states. Uh, so they are of management interest to our state wildlife agencies. Uh, we've also selected them because uh, they are on the landscape uh, and habitats that, that we expect short-eared owls to be in. So there are many other species of greatest conservation need, but uh, we won't necessarily be in the habitats of those. So we focused on these as the most likely species of greatest conservation needs that we would encounter during the survey. So let's get on to the five species uh, that we collect data on. And each of these species, we just collect a total count at the end of the survey. We aren't doing the minute by minute observation for all of these species. We're just saying at the end of this point, how many, in this case, long-eared owls did you see at this point? How many ferruginous hawks, etc. So long-eared owl, we uh, talked about in the identification video, the last training video on identification. Remember, it's got the the dark comma-shaped carpal patches, similar to a short-eared owl, but it has much more color on the breast and barring on the breast, and the face has is um, uh, rufousy brown, and the ear tufts, if they're visible, uh, will be much longer than a short-eared owl ear tufts would ever be. So we will collect at each point the total count of long-eared owls that we see. Now most of you won't be in a habitat where long-eared owls would be a uh, likely species to see, but if you are around riparian areas or forest shrub boundary, uh, they are a possibility, so we need to keep an eye out for them. The next species is not a species of greatest conservation need in uh, any of the states, uh, but it does have uh, relevance to short-eared owl research. Uh, it is believed that the short-eared owl habitat is a complete subset of the northern harrier habitat. So any place we find short-eared owls, we would expect to also find northern harriers. So we are uh, collecting the counts of northern harriers at each point uh, to uh, test that hypothesis. Um, and we covered the identification uh, in the last uh, video. Uh, long, slender wings, this really tippy, low flight uh, often. Uh, the males can be very white like a shorter owl, but they lack those uh, uh, comma-shaped carpal patches at the end of the wing. 
Next one up is a species of greatest conservation need in most of our inner mountain west states anyway, uh, the ferruginous hawk. Um, these are the largest uh, budio or soaring hawk in uh, North America. Um, they often show uh, when they're perched a very white, you can see on the left hand side here, this very visible white breast that just glows uh, brightly. Uh, and their head, as it shows in this photo as well, often looks squat and flattened out at the top and grayish in general. Uh, Ferruginous hawks, if you do get good views like this, can be distinguished by their, uh, they have feathered tarsi, so the feathers come all the way down the legs to the, uh, to the base of the toes. And they have this large gape. Uh, the yellow uh, mouth opening extends way back below the eye. So if you get a great view of them, those are characteristics to look at. In the flight uh, pattern, we look for these long, slender, almost pointed wings with a slight tip of the wing forward um, uh, at the wrist. And then, uh, in addition, they, it doesn't show in this video as much, but they fly in a slight dihedral, so a slight V shape. The wings are slightly higher than the body. And this is important in, the, in these cases. Uh, this is a light, uh, or uh, the typical morph, which is light colored. Um, I'll show you some photos of a dark morph, which are much more difficult to distinguish from uh, the other species. So we look at the flight pattern, shape, etc. cetera. Uh, they don't always show those dark uh, feathered tarsi, but the feathered tarsi come all the way down. You can see this white um, uh, light morph. Uh, Ferruginous perched on the left uh, has feathered tarsi easily visible, but uh, they're white instead of dark. Uh, so that's the thing to look at. The head does look gray and squat. And then these two photos on the right uh, are the dark morph uh, of the Ferruginous, which can be more difficult to distinguish from, say, a dark morph red-tailed hawk. Um, but look at those wing shapes. Uh, once again, long, slender, almost pointed. Uh, and uh, the feathered tarsi and the gape if you get an opportunity to, uh, to see the bird up close, flattened gray head. Uh, so Ferruginous hawks are exciting to see out there. Next up, uh, burrowing owls. So uh, a number of you, especially a little bit later in the survey season, will be in areas where burrowing owls can occur. So as you're searching for short-eared owls on the ground, keep an eye out for these guys. Uh, they have a uh, uh, proportionally smaller head and, and more rounded face. They have a little bit of gray on their face, but not, not as uh, dominant as a short-eared owl. Um, so uh, keep an eye out for those, and I'll play a couple sounds of burrowing owls here for you. Okay, the first sound is the typical hoot, or what they call a coo-coo sound for a burrowing owl. And then we have a, a, an alarm call. And in flight, they can give single calls. So these, as you can tell, sound quite different from the short-eared owl calls um, and uh, can be distinctive, and this might draw your attention to, to find these if they're hidden behind clumps of grass. Sometimes they're very difficult to see. And then our last species we want to focus on is not a raptor. It's the uh, long-billed curlew. Uh, these are shorebirds, but they nest in grasslands, often uh, great distances from water, um, and uh, they they nest in, not, not in colonies, but uh, there may be many nests on the landscape and the adults will come together and uh, uh, communally defend the territory from things like ravens. So if you see ravens around, uh, you may see long-billed curlews responding to them uh, uh, to, uh, in a group defense of an area. And I'll play some calls of the long-billed curlew. So here's the whistle call and also the alarm call. So they can easily be mistaken for uh, gull species. And here's the alarm call. So 
So that's the call you'd likely hear if you saw them uh, communally defending uh, against uh, ravens. So moving on, those are the five species. Once again, we're going to get a count of each one at each point, but not do the minute by minute protocol. And lastly, I want to talk about eBird. If for those of you who are interested in submitting your data to eBird, we do encourage you to do so, uh, but we have some suggestions uh, to take into account. First of all, uh, um, I, we suggest that you not do 11 separate stationary counts, that you just do one count for the uh, whole survey as a traveling count, so a single traveling count. And we suggest that you maybe write your observations at each point on your data sheet and not worry about entering them at the time because the survey for shorter owls is going to consume most of that hour and a half and you have very little extra time available to allocate to eBird. So if you just record your information on your data sheet, you can enter it into eBird after the survey is over. Uh, so be careful with that time management and how much time you spend on the eBird. The priority is number one, the short-eared owl observations uh, uh, and the habitat data, and then the five species of interest, and then lower priority would be eBird data. And if you do happen to see a nest location for a short-eared owl, this is one of the reasons that a traveling count would be fine. Um, you can go ahead and enter that as a nest, uh, but we would but we ask that you not put the specific nest location onto eBird. Uh, so if it's a six mile traveling count and you observed a nest, um, uh, that's not an issue for us and we encourage you to go ahead and enter that. So that concludes the uh, seventh and final pre-survey training video for Project Waffles. As always, we welcome your feedback. Uh, you can post it on our Facebook page or contact your state coordinator. If you have additional questions, uh, there are uh, uh, different resources on the website and, and you can address those questions to the state coordinator. Thank you for your time and your support of this program.